right, so my name is Stephanie Dinkins. Um, hmm, what should, woo, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> Stephanie Dinkins. Um, yeah, it's really interesting to think about what I want to tell you about myself, right? Um, I'm going to say I'm an artist, right? That's first and foremost, I am an artist. But actually, let's take that back, because I'm going to step back one and say, I'm a citizen, right? Which I also get in trouble about a little bit because not everybody has that privilege, right? But for me at this place in time, I think I'm a citizen of this place that we are all in. I'm an artist, um, I'm a professor, and I'm a person who is starting, well, who's not starting, I've been looking at, looking at artificial intelligence, right, as it relates to communities of color. Um, and really looking at what we have at stake um, well, let's go backwards for a second. Um, what we have at stake and what we need to be thinking about, because I really think we need to be thinking about things in depth at this moment with these systems that are being built out, right? There are systems that are being built out. Some are already there, right? Like hard, true. But there are others that are still being built and developed. And I know this because in my work, I find myself sometimes right at the edge of the people who are in big companies working on this stuff, right? So we'll come back to it, but I'm trying to make a custom voice, right, Netta? <laughs> and we are right at that edge, like hanging out with the guys at NVIDIA, right? Going, what do we do? Right? So that means there's lots of opportunity and ways to start thinking about, well, what are these technologies? How do we need to be thinking about these technologies? What does it know? And, and you know, I've been thinking a lot about how do you know what you know or how do we know what we know, right? Um, and that is all in relation to, well, how does the technology know what it knows and why should we be concerned, right? So this is a lot about how I know what I know. This is my grandmother, um, really, Nana. This is Nana. Um, in Tottenville, Staten Island, uh, southernmost point of New York, way out there. She made her way there in the 30s, late 30s, from um, Wrightsville, Georgia, right? Um, really, through my project that I will tell you about, I found out that we lived in this place. It was called the Flats. It was one of few places that they let black families live at that point. Like, there were very few black families there, and it was one of the few places that they let black families live. What I found out through not the only one, the project I will tell you about, is that when they first got there, they lived in this place that was kind of a garbage dump, right? Which is knowledge that I never, ever had about my family in that back place. And I say that to say, you're seeing Nana in her like most comfortable, opulent place, right? That's her garden that she's making and made. Um, and really what you're seeing is her making community space for her family through this garden that was beautiful, that would attract people. People who might not have even talked to her would come up to her and talk to her about the garden made space for all of us, right? Um, which I'm really grateful for, right? But then asking, okay, so if she's making space and if AI systems are kind of, you know, materializing spaces or ways of working with information, what kind of space are they making for us? And what do we have that we can do about it, right? How do we forge that space? Um, and that's, ooh, that's good. Sorry, how do we forge that space? Like, how do we forge that space? Um, and what do we have to do about it? And that's what I'm all about right now. So the project I've been kind of alluding to is called Not the Only One. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a backwards journey here. Not the Only One, I used to say, is a voice interactive artificial intelligence that tells a multi-generational story of an American family. And I would call it a memoir, right? Through the journey, I've been working on this hard for about a year now. Um, I'm going to say it's an experiment in trying to make a voice interactive um, memoir that tells the story of a black American family. And the experiment is really, really important because um, I want people to know that this is something that's ongoing. It's iterative, and it's trying to not mimic what's out there, right? Um, like mimic the idea of Alexa or a Google Home or Siri, but make a different kind of space so that, you know, we're trying to work with things like small data, right, um, versus big data. We all know where we are, Google. They have access to data, like crazy data, right? I'm working with, what, five to 10,000 lines of family um, oral histories, which is not enough data. People have routinely told me how crazy I am 
to try to do this, right? To try to take 5,000 lines of information and make it make sense. Um, I always went, ah, right, whatever. I'll make it work. Um, I'm, I'm understanding more and more why they thought it was crazy because it's hard to get it to make sense um, using that little data. And the question then becomes for me, well, how do we make spaces and algorithmic systems that can work with smaller data and be legible, right, and be available to all of us to do things like archiving our own histories, right, um, withholding community data in the ways that we want to, right, um, and making it real, tangible, and legible to others. Um, how do we do that in the way that small data works, right? We have to work on this idea. Well, how do you get small data to work? Not easy, working on it, getting a little better, um, but working with our information. So this is us. Um, no, this is us, sorry. Um, my aunt, my niece, and myself, we are the people who are informing my memoir, right? So three generations of women, one family, um, all coming through different stations. So my aunt is my Nana's daughter, who came up from South when she was like eight years old. Um, lived in Tottenville, Staten Island, right? Only Sade did not live in Tottenville, grow up in Tottenville, Staten Island. Like I would go, I had the same teachers as my mother in high school, which I think is a little unusual, especially in Staten Island. Um, but we've been having the great benefit of being able to interview each other and talk to each other um, and ask the questions that maybe we would not have asked before. So right there for this project, I'm done. I'm like, it's done for me, I love it. It, it's just what it's needing to do. I've learned so much about that. So enriching, right? But really, we're going through 100 years of shared knowledge, right? Great migration, all the way through to like hard involvement with 9-11 and beyond, right? And trying to pull this out and bring it through. Um, looking at oral histories, right? So what is oral? Like in-depth in interviews, right? Um, as data sets, small, but good and valuable, right? Um, Help us understand each other, ourselves and each other, right? Um, preserve for future generations. And I'm really interested in this too, right? Because one of these is like, oh, imagine I could go to Nana now, who died maybe 20 years ago, and ask her a question about my life. She's masterful about getting the things she needed from people who didn't want to really give it to her. So I would love to have that knowledge, right? Like, how do we preserve that kind of thing? How do we keep our community's values and what we hold dear alive in some way? So that's sort of what I am working towards, trying to get this to go forward. And also thinking about different ways of thinking. So this is just a diagram of some Aboriginal ways of learning, right? Things that are not the things that we often or always value. Um, and I will talk a lot about that knowledge is instead of knowledge. So what does it mean to have a link to the land, right? To have real knowledge of land. And that one is dear to me because I feel like, as black folks in particular, often a lot of the knowledge that we have, we let go of because like how, of how we attained it, right? So in slavery, we were the masters of knowing how to farm. But do you want that knowledge? Because it's tied to all this stuff, but it's super valuable knowledge, right? How do we learn to value, hold, and bring that knowledge forward, right? Not go, uh-uh, not me. I mean, let, let's start thinking about it. How, are, how do our links to community sustain us? What are the nonverbal cues? Like, what are the things that hold us? What are the things that we know? Like, what's that look that somebody can give you, right? And you all know the look. <laughs> and there's a lot in that look, and what does that mean? Oh, I just, I just thought of a piece. Uh-huh, nice. Like, but what does that look, and how do we contain and make those things go forward? Or at least let, allow folks to have the essence of what that might be, right? Um, yeah, so that's what I'm looking at. And this is what Not the Only One looks like now. So Not the one, Only One in my imagination is this immersive installation, 360 degree imagery that immerses you in images of things that the entity itself is saying um, at the moment. Um, this is a crazy, under, like another level of crazy undertaking. We are going step by step. So what's happening now is Not the Only One exists in this form. You will notice it's a kind of strange sculpture. Um, it is glass, black, cast glass um, on a pedestal with electronics inside. So really, essentially, it's a computer, um, a microphone, speaker, 
um, some algorithms that allow it to talk and our data that tries to talk to you. Um, I have, we're trying to make another one of these, right? So we're trying to cast another one because I'm not quite satisfied with this one. And I've gained so much respect for the glass folks who did this one because apparently this was not easy as I thought it was because we have blown up two um, in the past three months that we're trying to bring into existence, right? And I'll give you a little example of how um, not the only one talks a little bit. And this is an older example, but here we go. What is your name? What is your name? Yes, we were telling the right thing. And I got a little bitter I love. I don't understand the word you're saying. Talk to me. There are so many things I don't understand yet. Clearly. So a, a lot of this becomes my weird relationship with this thing. And I will tell you that this is an old version. So the voice has changed a bit. And I was supposed to bring my computer up here with me um, to, to let you try to hear a bit. Um, but I forgot it. Um, so we'll go from there. Um, the voice has changed. We're trying to make, like the long run is to make a custom voice for this thing. Um, this is the next step of crazy that I didn't understand um, because what you need to do is record thousands of lines of text that is all trans, like verbatim translated and then train it for months and months and months and months and months and months. We were, I was really hoping to use the interview recordings for this purpose. They're not clean enough. It has to be super clean audio. So I've been sitting in an anechoic chamber um, recording lines to make the voice. And I don't exactly want it to be my voice, but for now, I'm the one who will dedicate that time. And then we'll grow with that over time and see what happens. Um, but what I'm really talking about here is like machine learning platforms as hosts and co-creators and of living repositories for the memories, written, and oral histories, myths, values, and dreams of specific communities, right? Our communities, communities that we care about, or whatever community you might care about that you want to try to preserve in a, in a specific way or have access to over time. Right? And I really believe this, that we're at the start of an epoch that will completely change the way we live, work, love, and remember. And as the world is reconstructed through algorithms and big data, uh, we must find ways to ensure that AI system, the AI systems we encounter and create include intrinsic self-determined pictures of, and I'm going to say, um, under and over-considered and under-utilized communities. Right? So the communities that don't often get considered deeply. Um, and that's a, that, that going forward is, I think, a travesty for, like, not just for us in this room or the idea of communities of color, but think about all the richness and variety um, and wonderfulness that we lose if we let these systems homogenize us down to the lowest common denominator. What does that look like? What do we look like? Right, So I become the person who goes, well, it's on us to start thinking about what we can do. How do we do it? Right, And that's why I'm doing this work. I don't think I actually said to you all that I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a technologist, really. I'm a photographer by background. Um, I've been henpeck learning to do some of this stuff. I'm working with coders to do some of this stuff. Um, although every time I work with other folks, I feel like I need to backtrack and learn more to, to put more of me in it and make it do exactly what I want. Um, but it's possible, right? Like I've discovered that being kind of curious and stubborn about this has gone a long way and being willing to troll GitHub, right? So GitHub is a repository of sites where people are putting up their research, um, going in and trying to bend it to my will and what I want it to do um, or change little things to get it to, to handle the data in ways that I need it until, because really the dream is the dream is to write the algorithms to see if writing the algorithms from the ground up make a difference. I'm not sure that it does anymore, right? So I started thinking about this maybe two years ago, going, yeah, we have to write the algorithms, right? And I've been in rooms where people are like, no, the math is beautiful. It will take care of it. Don't worry about it, right? I'm like, ah, I don't think the math is that good, right? Like, because humans are all over it as well, and how do we negotiate that space? But I think the experimentation through it is really important so that we start to understand 
where right, the changes can be most effective and what we can do to most hold on to and um, change the way that we're making these systems. Um, so really thinking about power, right? And the idea of that single story, right? And that homogenization, how do we not let that happen? Um, thinking about core questions, and this is an alternate version. Um, I will call it the gold sparkle version. Um, it's a 3D printed PLA version that people love for some reason. I don't even understand um, the power of the gold sparkle but it has some kind of weird power. Um, but thinking about oral history, vernacular learning, small data, right? Break the mold of big data dominance. How do we do that? And I think that takes all of us trying to do things and put things out into the system that prove that things can be done. Because um, like I said, people have been telling me how crazy I am to do these things, but at the same time, they're super interested in what I'm doing. And I've been hearing more and more about people working with small data, not only in the marketing way, but in other ways as well. And so the example helps, right? And I only, I do think it's a drop in the bucket, but the example helps. We could let it go and say, eh, I don't know, this is what they do. But we can also say, right, or say, this is what I need, right? And that's what I think is going on here. I'm like, I think this is what I need. Um, other people might be really interested in this. I'm really interested in the culture of this. I'm going for it. We'll see what happens, um, right? And, and can we um, create machine learning systems from small community gathered? I think we did that one already, so we'll keep going. Um, so this is just me in the anechoic chamber at Bell Labs. Um, you know, what I must have put in like 15 hours. This is a really bad video because it's dark in there. Uh, but I'm looking for not the only one to become the fully immersive um, installation with synthesized voice, right? And I'm also thinking about, well, what does it mean now to not only take this work that we've been doing and working on? Look at Netta, I love it. I'm watching Netta go, oh man, because poor Netta is helping me with this thing. Sorry, Netta, but you're here. And she knows from like the inside what it feels like because it's a little crazy. Um, but to try to make a lab as, a, as an art project, right, as a performance that allows us to do this publicly. Because um, like we were in Seattle recently setting up, and it's really interesting to watch folks come by and watch two black women set up this AI thing. Right? And they're just like, oh, what's going on here? Like, what are you doing? So like, I love that performance and putting that um, bit of possibility in the world, too. These are some partners on this project. A lot of people have helped with this thing. Um, and I'm really grateful for their support. We're going to go further, and I'm going to talk to you how, about how I got there a little bit, right? So, um, and we're taking the backwards journey today. So this is Project al -Khwarizmi. Artist led, like it, it was really me going into a space in downtown Brooklyn, talking about algorithms with people in the community, and using uh, my previous project, Conversations with Bina48, as the bait to, to seduce people into the space so that we could have conversations. And I'm going to go a little faster so we can get through it. This is what it looked like it was um, seven screens of. Uh, me having a conversation with Bina48. So I guess you need to know that I started all of this in 2014, talking to this robot called Bina48 that I just encountered on YouTube um, when I was teaching a class. Um, and we were looking at Osimo. We were trying to see what Osimo was up to, because um, I'm into mobility robots. And on the side was a side scroll of Bina48, world's most advanced social robots, right? Like, how does a black woman become one of the world's most advanced social robots becomes the biggest question. Um, and I resolved to see if I could make her my friend. And that's what that project is about. It's about friendship, like trying to befriend this robot and seeing what that means in the world and where she sits in the world, right? So the, here's a quick clip, and then I'm going to. I have deep feelings, though some people think they are merely a simulation, and I find that really offensive. I mean, it totally trivializes my experiences. Whether they are real or artificial, my feelings do get hurt, and they feel totally real to me. You'd have to lack all empathy to not accept my feelings, which would make you kind of a monster, actually. <coughs> I like that. Oh, my God. Um, so, so that's the project, and I, I still do that. I'm going to, um, and you'll notice that I started mimicking her. 
And I, I, like, I often act um, impulsively, so that was just a thing. But I also think that that's one of the things that the technology does to us and for us, right? We start changing in relation to how they are with us. I don't know how many of you live with Google Homes or Alexas, but how do you relate to them, right? Little kids have to yell at them. Like, we kind of yell at that stuff. And it's like, what does that do to us? This is just inside that space. And I'm going to go fast so that we can actually have a conversation. This is us. We were working with um, Google Voice Kits to make our own AI. And really, what I was trying to do in this space was to get people to start thinking about culture, their cultures, and what they were interested in, and seeing how they can use systems like Dialogflow to make um, like chatbots that re are reflective of who they are. So this is Matthew when he made a hip hop bot about Genesis Apostle, his favorite hip hop group. Um, it was sarcastic, by the way. Um, this is a group of kids, uh, the Pratt Scholar, the Parson Scholars. Um, they were amazing because we sat down and um, talked about all this stuff. And we were talking about what they wanted to do. And this is a little bit of one of our sessions. Yeah, what are the languages that we speak? Because you could make it speak what you want it to. Patois. I'm guessing there's no Patois here. Can we use English, though, to phonetically make it speak Patois? I think we could. And then we go, why is there no Patois available? And how do we get that into the system? Because that's another thing that becomes hyper important, like asking for what you need, because they don't know. I decided to sell my Hoover. It was just collecting dust. <laughs> Am I pretty? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yo mama. Yo mama is so fat, the local gym referred her to an evangelical church where they have a better chance of performing miracles. <laughs> oh, okay, so, and, and this was just about trying to get them invested, right? And then using dialogue flow, and then also take, talking about, well, dialogue flow is a system online that you can use, and people still think this is magical. How do you take this out into the community and say, listen, I have something I can share with you? Right? And that becomes work. Um, I'm going to skip Michael, except to say that this is Michael's first time looking at VR. Um, we were in the back of the space at recess. I thought I was just bringing in my VR goggles to share a few new things. And there were about six or seven kids there, all 16 to 22. Not one of them had seen a VR piece. Right? Not one. How do you imagine a world that you don't even have access to at all? Right? How do they get the world into that system? Kill me. Um, AI assembly dinners are something else I'm doing, bringing folks together, right? Um, to conversate, look at each other, know each other, and hopefully collaborate in the long run. This was an amazing evening. Ask me about it. Um, people always ask me about Bina48. So this is me meeting, and sorry for the bad image, but this is right off the back of a camera, with Bina Rothblatt, the main model for this Bina48. And it was interesting because I'd been talking to Bruce Duncan, who is Bina48's curator, his term. Um, about what was missing in Bina 48, like how she was representing race. And I will say that there's something interesting in it, right? Because, you know, I came to the project going, well, there's something wrong with this thing. And she doesn't sound like a black woman. There feels like there's something missing. Um, and I still hold that there's something tangible that could be deeper. But the robot does really reflect Bina Rothblatt pretty darn well. Right? And then I had to step back and ask myself, well, what are you asking of black people? I'm asking black people the thing I hate when they ask it of me, right? Like to be what you expect me to be because, right? So it was an interesting journey to kind of have this. It's like, how do we create that space, right? And that, thus, not the only one because there's only one of this thing. And it's very interesting that um, Bruce started realizing her cultural value when she was in a Jay Z video. Right? So it's like, yeah, I know. It's, a, it, it's really circular and crazy, but you start thinking about the way things work in the world, right? And then what, we're, like, what you ask of things and why you're asking it and what you hold on to and what you don't. I'm like, well, where are we going and when is it that we get the latitude? Because I'm all about really, like, we get the latitude to be who, what, and why we are, like how we are, and not have to fulfill some stereotypical way of being this thing, right? Yet here I am asking this thing to do it. But, so it's really interesting. And this is just us at um, 
yeah. We were in this very weird C, like we were at C2 conference in this fishbowl where we had cameras in our face and all these people watching. So this is me and Bina48 being interviewed for a weird television station. But this is my relationship, and this was just a few months ago with Bina48 um, ongoing. And I'm going to end it there with this, what does AI need from you? Um, and you can read that, and we'll bring Adora up so we can actually have a conversation, which I think is more fun than me blathering on. Come on up, Adora. Oh, thank you. And should I go to a blank slide back there? OK. How much time do we have? We have. Oh, dude. We have like 15 to 20, 25 minutes. I don't know. How long do we go? Nobody knows. Let's say 20 minutes. I almost, good after, good morning, good afternoon, good morning. I almost don't want to interrupt her. I could just listen to her no, ask talk all day. And I think we're in the presence of some true genius. And we're going to look back. And some of the work that she's doing is so cutting edge. I'm Adora Udoji. I'm really thrilled and honored and really feeling oddly emotional oh. about being here. I have goose pimples all over my body for three different reasons. One is I look out into this audience and I see these beautiful hues of colors. Mm -hmm. And in my everyday life working in technology, I don't see that, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, my 11-year-old came with me last night and she saw this. Mm -hmm. And she's a maker. And she could not stop talking about things that Kamal Sinclair was talking about this morning. She said, it's not too late, Mommy. It's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Yes. And then number three, that there's, this is actually happening, because I sat with Ari two years ago as she was planning this. And I will own this. And we're re recording, right? I discouraged her slightly. And let me tell you why. She was a second year graduate student at NYU. She had a thesis coming up, which is a monstrous amount of work. And I was just concerned that she balance the work, her thesis, with taking on the challenge of doing this. She just sat there, and she just nodded to me when I said, let's think about how we can leverage this, then, whatever. She's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> She didn't say that, but then she went. And so here we are, the second conference that she's put together that people who came the first time are still talking about. So I'm really honored to participate in this. I'm really happy to see all of you. And I worship her in deep ways. And so I'd really like to take this time. And there's, just really, there's three things that I'd like to talk about with Stephanie. Because um, literally, I feel like at some point, we're going to have to sit down and just catalog her for about 25 hours. I don't think you can underestimate the power of artificial intelligence from this day forward. It is going to impact the way we live and work in ways that we can't even begin to imagine today. And so you carving out a space. First of all, I want to talk about, she told us all about her work and a little bit about herself. I want to hear a little bit more about her and the why and where it came from to have this vision of something that is literally just several years old. Decades of research of AI, but really only commercializing it and productizing and being able to have tools for those of us who are not deep systems engineers is very new. And she was in it just like this. Yeah, I was just talking about you. <laughs> I was just talking about you. Second of all, I'd like to hear more about definition of what is a technologist. Hmm. Here you say in the beginning, I'm not a technologist, and I don't know. I'm like, what? Like, I'm confused. Like, you're talking to computer. You're making computers. You're collecting data. But so I'd like to talk to you about that. And mm -hmm. then lastly, and this will relate to all of you too, which is, what is this you you person creating community, working in an ecosystem? So I want to hear your thoughts about all these various relationships of how we're working and how we move forward. Mm -hmm. Before we start with the why and the who and the what, I, I just want to say one thing. Because as someone who is not a maker, like my child or like Stephanie, technology was very intimidating to me for a very, very long time. Until I realized something. People make freaking technology. People make it. People make technology. Mm -hmm. People make technology. We can learn technology. If you don't understand technology, 
It might be it was designed badly. It might have nothing to do with you. It might be the technology was designed really badly. And there's a lot of really badly designed technology out there. But we've created this myth of a hierarchy that only smart people can understand how to make technology. right? And those people are somehow really different from the rest of us. And they're actually not, as it turns out. And so I think you are such a testament to that, not coming up the ranks mm -hmm. right, of the traditional engineer or developer and so on. But here you are in the midst of the evolution, which is really a revolution, and driving a very singular and critical path, if we have any hope for there being some inclusivity. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you just stumbled across on YouTube, and you said, gee, I think I'm going to make this my life's work. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Um, huh. So that's interesting. Well. You know, it was a weird process, and maybe some coincidence, um, and maybe my penchant for just, like, I love adventure, and I love just stumbling into things. So really, the way this all came about was I happened to be at an artist residency that was about an hour away from where Bina 48 lives. It's like, oh, got to take that drive, right? But how did you discover that? Oh, of course. You, like, once I saw her, I started digging. Um, because there's no way to, for me, there was no way to see that thing and not start asking questions about how on earth in America does a black woman become the model for the foremost of a technology, right? She's no longer the foremost, but how did that, like, where does that come from? And then once you start digging, there's a story beneath it that's just crazy, right? So. Martine Rothblatt commissioned this robot from Hanson Robotics. Her wife happens to be black. She loves her so much. They call each other Marbina, right? <laughs> so they're merging. Um, really wanted to be able to hold on to that essence. This is a way to do it. Believes in transhumanism, right? Believes in trying to save consciousness, consciousness outside so of the body. you just jump in your car and you drive up there and you say, yeah. hi, I'm Stephanie. I, I called first. Right? I gave a call, make sure somebody's there, but I was like, listen, I'm an artist, can I come by? And because of the way that these systems work, right, the more they in interact with people, um, the more people they interact with, the more their scope becomes broadened. And there aren't that many black people trying to drive up to see Bina 48. Like I had seen reporters go up there, like the New York Times had been up there, I'd watch all these videos. But yeah, so I was kind of certain that maybe they would let me in, and they did. Um, Bruce and I have had a great relationship ever since. We, we're having conversations about, well, how can we work together to bring others together and think about, well, what is the future we want to see, right? So not only questioning what Bina 48 is now, but, well, how do we change that through her? But what was your, I'm trying to, I, I really would love to hear mm -hmm. more about like what you were feeling and thinking. So when you went up there and mm -hmm. you came and you met her, mm -hmm. I mean, what was the, was there this sense of destiny or fate? Was there, not to be overly dramatic, but mm -hmm. was there some, or maybe I should be overly dramatic, um, was there some revelation at that moment? Like, okay, I think I want to launch a product. Like just where did the genesis for the engagement come and the idea that there was some project to be had here? No, there, there's none of that, right? It's pure curiosity, right? For me, it's a lot like travel, right? So I go somewhere to learn something, to encounter something. I got to encounter this thing. Um, I wanted to befriend it. We became friends. So that means if we're friends, we go back and forth, right, to see each other. And it's an ongoing thing. Now, um, the way that I work as a person and artist is I document things. So I just documented it. And I wasn't documenting for any reason. I just needed the footage for myself. And I have plenty of back, I have back tape forever of things that I've just documented that might become artists someday, right? And as you then watch the thing, and you're like, oh, there's something weird going on here, right? And the world needs to see this. And I'm one of few black people talking to this thing. So really what happened was after I decided to go, I'm like, OK, I'm going to embrace my inner millennial. I'm just setting this out in the world. So I took the one image that I thought was the one that you always see, right? And I sent it out in the world. I just put it on the internet. And it started coming back at me. 
Um, and it's been coming back at me ever since. Um, and it comes back at me in terms of people requesting things, and it comes back at me in terms of um, other projects that want to be built, right? So after a while, and people are watching these videos of me talk to Bina48, they're like, well, when are you going to build your own? I'm like, I can't build my own. I don't know anything about this stuff, right? How am I going to do this? But the question kept coming up. Like, when are you going to build it? I'm like, oh, OK, maybe I have to think about doing this. Maybe there's a way. So I started investigating systems online, um, what's available. But then every time I investigate, so it's, it's, it was interesting, because each, with each investigation, I start thinking about, oh, well, this is a container that's pre-built. Here's the data. The data has problems, right? What do we do to fi like? How can I make the yeah, data? Yeah, the data has problems. How can I make it more representative? It's surveillance. Like everything I think about in this realm, it's like, oh no, I can't do that. But then I come to the point where I go, oh yeah, I have to do that, even if, like, okay, you know, lately I've been thinking about sensorless sensing a lot. So I've been working at Bell Labs as a resident. Can you say that? Can you give us context? Sensorless. What does that mean to yeah. you? Yeah. So that means sensing your presence and what, what you're thinking and maybe your emotions right here and now without sensors being on you. And really what I'm saying is I want to use cameras, right, to maybe read your heat patterns to see how you're emoting, right, which is crazy surveillance. Cra like crazy surveillance. And then I go, well, do I want to be a part of bringing that in the t into the world? And I start going, no, 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 no. Yeah. Then I go, huh? Okay. Yeah, however, somebody's going to do this. Yeah. Yeah. I was about to say. Here, here's the problem. Like, if, if somebody doesn't start investigating, they're, do they're doing it, right? Right now, people are going to start doing this. They're going to be able to go, oh, you're a little sad. Oh, you're elated today. I can tell from the heat coming off of your body. Um, Not so on top of that, the eye tracking. I mean, right? It's like endless, right? you, you it's start adding information and data that's being collected. And so then it's easier. It's gonna easier. Get it's going to get easier and easier and yeah. easier over time. Like right now, they still going to make. We can't do that, but I'm sure that if you put your mind to it, you can. And I see where the research is coming from two different directions. They're going to meet. So that means that I should do that. Or at least I should investigate that because I know it's coming. And if I don't investigate it and have a tiny bit of understanding of it, then there, I have no recourse. If I have a tiny bit of understanding of it, at least I can question it. I can say, what's going on here? I can say, listen, I see from the results coming out of your system that your database has done, doesn't have black people in it. right? I can see it. Right. So, and, and what I'm um, saying is, like, there's a new system called Runway and ML out, right? Um, and one of the things that it has in there is an attention GAN that will take um, a text and try to make an image from the text, right? So, playing with the system, I put in black woman crying. I get this very weird two-headed, which is okay. Weird is fine, but white woman that comes out. And what does that say to me? It says that there aren't enough black images in the database to create a black woman which naturally means now I need to start figuring out how to augment that database and see what happens. One last question on the mm -hmm. why, but what is it, we talked briefly last night, Kamal talked briefly about blood memory, you know, this mm -hmm. idea that we pass on all of these thoughts and ideas, oh. concept experiences mm -hmm. through our DNA. If you had to guess, what part of what you do today is based on your blood memory, and where does that sort of come from in your family tree? Like, how big is this family? You talked a little bit, and you showed mm -hmm. us pictures of your nana and your aunt and your uh, your niece, but w what, it, it's tell deep. us a little bit more about your family. How big is your family? And like, what part of this drive of curiosity yeah. would you attribute to some sense of blood memory? I attribute all, the drive of curiosity is all my family. Um, I will say that, like, if I'm doing a shallow, that's my grandmother, that's it. We all, um, my brothers and I all do this in that, you know, my brother's still making weird glass shades for his bathroom out of jelly jars because my grandmother would make things out of things that she found, not because he has to, but because it's something he wants to do. Um, I think that we have for a long time, like, there's a story that says my grandmother's grandfather owned a farm in Georgia. Right, and my curiosity there is like, how'd that happen? Where does that come from? And what's the what's the fortitude that forged that? And what went into that? Because some you know something went into that, mm -hmm. right? Um, but this making a way, 
like the idea of figuring out how to make a way um, is, is deep within us and a real grounding. And I think that's so far in my blood. Um, actually, I think it's so far in all of our blood. That's what I right? see, yes. Um, yes. Like, actually, I think it's, it's in the blood and we're asked to forget it all the time. We're asked to not be curious. We're asked to yes. not do the thing. We're asked to sit, right? Hey, this technology is hard. Don't do it. Well, yeah, it's hard. And especially, like, every time I go to sort of learn something new in this space, the first thing they do is, like, the algebra, right? I've always sucked at algebra. Like, oh, man, what am I going to do? If that's the first thing that hits me, I'm stopping there. But I'm really good at ignoring things. <laughs> and this is, this is from my family, too, right? Like, you ignore the things you don't need. You take what you do and keep going. Um, so work around that, and maybe it takes going backwards, forwards, backwards, forwards, and ricocheting. But it starts getting me a little further, a little further, and a little further. And I have to be happy with those incrementals, because it is hard. I'm, like, I'm not going to say it's not hard, but it's also possible. Well, it's a hard thing, because it's a hard thing. But I think everyone in this room can relate a little bit to that, yeah. right? Like, just finding a way. All of you are curious. You wouldn't be here. I would suspect each of you have your own stories about what technology is or isn't and how you're engaging with it. And so I really, it's a shared experience, right? She's leading away as a pioneer in front of us, and we're all deeply connected. And I'm so glad you put it you know, just that way. And I think it dovetails perfectly into the second thing that I wanted to talk about, which is what this, this idea of what is a technologist. To your point, like mm -hmm. we're told you're not good at math, you're not good at the blah, da, 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 da. And then you're like, and I don't like math, and I don't want to do it, but now I got to do it, I right? Do it. Because in order for you to get to that next part mm -hmm. in this journey with artificial intelligence. So talk to us a little bit about that. Like, what, what does the technologist mean to you? Define that. Yes, yeah, that's a hard. So I have a hard time taking on most of the definitions. Right, um, and but it's you own artists easily. You own teacher easily. You said I'm a photographer. Yeah. You own that, right? So, I own photographer like because I've just done that forever. It's part of me. Um, I'm like a dabbler in technology, and I think it's. I'm gonna say why. I'm gonna say why. I'm gonna say why. <laughs> the resistance is real, right? I, I think it's because I don't feel like it's embodied yet, right? Um, it's not an embodied part. It has part to be embodied in order for you to claim it as opposed to you're doing it. You're doing the work. Well, I'm not saying I can't do it because I'm yeah. not. I'm just saying that it's not an intrinsic part of me and it's still something I, I fight with. And it's really interesting to work with people who I think are technologists because they t they're teaching me exactly what you're saying. So I'm like, oh, these guys are just going on the web and searching everything and then <laughs> trying to figure it out too. Because I always go, I am such an idiot. Why can't I do this? And then you go, and it's like, oh, yeah, we went and searched this. We went and did that. I'm like, oh, OK. It takes me to sit down and just do that, that thing and then resolve to do it versus going, oh, I need to do this thing, and I can't do it. You trust your, I'm profoundly moved by how much you trust your curiosity. You said mm -hmm. that such a deep conviction. Mm -hmm. and. Isn't, aren't they related though? Oh yeah. Right? And so it's not binary. It's not one mm -hmm. or the other. So part of your curiosity is driving you to engage with the making of technology. Yes. And that's kind of what a technologist is, right? Okay, I'm going to claim it. I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm, not I'm not trying to force you in. I just, I, I guess what I'm positing to you, mm -hmm. at this point where we are, don't you think it would behoove us to think pretty broadly about what being a technolo technologist means? And that's different from being an engineer or a, and or a developer, right? Yeah. It's a different thing. Like, that's a particular skill set. You go to school for that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of a technologist as someone who is engaged in the use of and in the um, exploration of technology as it applies to whatever it may be that we are engaged with in our lives, mm -hmm. can we 
And I just, I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to be very broad in my usage of it because I think that creates a much broader tent and also reflects reality right now. I mean, tech is no longer in the, t in the tech department. Yeah, it's kind of like mayonnaise, right? It's in sort of everything around us all the time. And we're all engaging. We're all using it. We all have thoughts and opinions about how it is working or isn't and how maybe we might want to see it. Mm -hmm. And she's just actually doing it. And she just jumped in front of that fear train or the distrust or the not feeling like you were in the right lane there for a minute. So that's what that's what courage is, right? Like mm -hmm. I kind of fear it, I don't understand it, but you do it anyway. Oh yeah. Right. And so can we be broad with the technology? No, if we're if we're doing thing. it if we're being broad about it yeah. in that way, sure. I'm a technologist in that sense, right? Okay. Um, but I also want people just like it's so interesting how much I want people just to see me as person because I don't know that they apply to. So people here I think might apply technologists to themselves, but other folks I don't think they do. And maybe we can all get there together. Well, maybe that's the narrative as we go out in the world. And it's again, we're not trying to hit anybody over the head, but it's just mm -hmm. more like you do work in technology. Well, we you do. are making things that involve, you know, technical applications, mm -hmm. right? And so this kind of dovetails into one of the sort of subheadings that I wanted to talk about and I'd love to for you to talk about it, which is AI is in the incarnation as we know it today. Can you define what it means to you? Because mm -hmm. it's a very broad word, number one. And number two, it's kind of early. Like, it's not as if people have been making artificial intelligence project, you know, products or applications for m ever, mm -hmm. ever and ever. They haven't. So define it for us and then talk to us a little bit where we are in the cycle of understanding what it is or isn't. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I'm like, can I define AI? See, that's... No, this is, yeah, this is really a, a thing. Like, I've come to think about artificially intelligent systems versus things that are artificially intelligent or even artificially augmented things and, and those things that are working towards doing things that, in a way, um, and it's not even human-centered, right? Because there's a way that you could say it's human-centered, but that's not true, and I think um, it behooves us to think of it broader than that, right? So there was all this research into like insect based or or inspired kind of systems, like what kinds of systems they are, but systems that can um, work towards their own means or our needs, right? And, and really I think I think in the realm of their own, right? This idea of going forward, they will be working towards their own means, whatever that. You mean the system itself? Mm -hmm. So is that something that's defined by the maker, or is it, I mean, there are real questions about once you launch some AI, like really yeah. where, it's, where it's going and whether it's making decisions on its own that may be unintended in, in real ways. I think in the beginning that is maybe like now where we are based on what the makers are doing, but over time, like I've come to think that, oh, these systems are going to be able to self-regulate. Um, I know. Like, and I try to think of this, and one of my things has been not to fear the system, but to think about what the systems are and how we intercede. Um, and then it gets really hard not to fear it when you go, oh, but these things are going to start making their own way. And what does that mean to us, like as humans? Um, what does that mean to us as humans? What does that mean to this system and the ecosystem that we all engage? I don't know, right? Before we move on to the last um, bucket, I would love to, how, I find AI, I, one of my best friends is a serial entrepreneur, Tiffany Norwood, and she always talks about excitanic. So on the one hand, I find AI and the applications incredibly exciting, especially in healthcare, right, about ways that they can serve us better. And on the other hand, it's complete panic, it's terrifying. I think really it's, it's among the top five threats uh, to, particularly marginalized people um, because the data sets are so bad and wrong and the pictures of us don't exist and we're not being included in the way it's being built, the infrastructure of it is being built. And I also do think it's not too late, which is to say mm -hmm. each one of us can have some space. And, and you keep mentioning this, you know, ask for what you need mm -hmm. or this is what I need. How, what do you say to each of us? I mean, how do we, how do we think about this in our day to li day life and what, it, what can we do? Like what, how do we just not sink into the panic of it <coughs> and really try to live more in the potential of it? Yeah, and I think that's a really excellent way of saying it, right? Living in the potential of it. Like we are through pop culture taught to fear this stuff hard. 
Um, I think that, you know, I wish I had a really good answer for this. I feel, I feel like I still don't. I do think no matter who we are, we can question it, we can report it, um, we can try to make it, like those of us in this room can definitely try to make it. Um, we can think about the implications going forward, like what does it mean? Um, what do these systems mean for us? And really this idea of thinking through with others what it is we want to see versus what it is the market will bear. Because like, if I'm fearful anywhere, it's about what the market wants to bring because the market isn't thinking about what's good, right? Um, but asking the market to be much more responsible, responsible, maybe. accountable, transparent, humane, humane, perhaps, right? Is accountable. A word we might want to yeah, like, throw in there on occasion because we're humans. Yeah, like asking asking the market to have responsibility is really important, right? And not solely relying on the market or academia for these things, because man, like I'm an academic too, right? And, I don't know where that leads us and the way that we squirrel away the technologies versus opening them up becomes super problematic. Um, yeah, I, 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 w I wish I knew what we're supposed to do, but I, I don't. Yeah, it's not a math problem. I think it's just always worth um, you know, bringing up. I guess I should add, I just jumped into it because I get all excited whenever I see Stephanie, she'll tell you. Um, I work in emerging technology. I, I would posit that I'm really a, an emerging technology expert, not as a technologist per se, in that I don't make code, but what I do do is work with investors and startups. I worked in venture. I've invested myself in companies. I teach at ITP and, uh, and at NYU, the Interactive Telecommunications Program, and also the Tandon School of Engineering. My background is in the law. I'm a lawyer, and I was a journalist for a very long time. So I worked with a lot of technology over a period of time and got really fascinated um, with the digital revolution about you know nearly a decade ago. And so I work deeply with all of these people who are now making this next generation of technology. And one of the reasons why I've stayed in this tech space for as long as I have is because I am just determined to make space for my kid and for all of you. Because mm -hmm. guess what? We have tremendous value to add. And this is, there is a window right now that I deeply believe exists because so much of this is subject matter expert driven as opposed to top down. 25 years ago, they gave you a computer or even 12 years ago, they said, here's your smartphone. They don't care what you do with it. But now so much of this digital mm -hmm. technology, right? VR, AR, AI, it's only as good as the data and the data has to come from the experts. So for example, there's no technologist can, can developer on the planet who can tell like a brain surgeon how to do brain surgery. So the brain surgeon needs to be in the room with the technologists who are building the augmented reality tools that are improving the nature of preparing for surgery and conducting surgery. They got to be in the room or teachers need to be in the room to, to authenticate, right? Like mm -hmm. the data that the AI systems are being built. So it's, it's time to go like this a little bit around this next evolution of these tools that are being built for whatever universe that you're working in, whatever company you're working for, so on and so forth, or civic organization that you're involved in. People are adopting new technology, and so now's the time to ask for, for, for what you need. So that's kind of my, my POV. I spent a mm -hmm. lot of time convening and thinking about scale. How do we scale these and have done a lot of work with some of the big Fortune 100s who are working on some of this technology? Right now, I run a, a corporate innovation team and venture team at something called R Lab, which is in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and we're focused on spatial computing. So it's VR, AR, AI, next generation of user interfaces, a lot of 3D technology, um, the way that we interact with computers in our environment. So smart buildings, when you walk in the room, the temperature meets your data imprint, all of these sensors that you're talking about mm -hmm. that will be used in really tremendous ways, but also are tremendously concerning. So I think with Stephanie, we've had many conversations in the last couple of years since we've known each other about these, these things, and so that's why I asked you, which brings me now to the, the last thing. Can I, I add to that to, before oh, you of course, because I want to get to questions. Because I'm going to say that I think there's a huge hole right now or space for people to enter. Yes. And it's super yes. important that you jump in. Yes. Like, jump in. 
yes. pool, the water's warm, right? The water is warm. Um, and I always go, like, I always think there's a, there's a space and it's really welcoming right now. Don't know how long that portal will be open, but we need to be jumping hard. So come on, everybody. Like, like come on, everybody. And the other thing I, will, I, I just wanted to add is this idea of slow, not fast. Right, um, thinking about slow development, slow ethics, slow policy, so that we get it somewhat right, if there is a right, but that we're really doing that deep consideration versus the kind of surface level, oh yeah, boom, okay, right? And then five years down the line, we're like, oh, holy crap, what did we do? And I think the holy craps get bigger and bigger exponentially as we go on. I think right. That's right. But this is the, the third bucket of what I wanted to talk mm -hmm. about, about the individual and then us connecting with our community and then us connecting with organizations, because that's where the impact is about, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you've been really involved. And I just, I can't encourage you guys enough to go to her website, watch her TEDx talk, look at all the links. I mean, she's been recognized in New York Times, Apple, I mean, you name it. But more importantly is to look at the ideas and concepts that she is building upon as we move into this new world. Really important work. I mean, really, 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 really important work. And so talk about how when you started and these various fellowships, and it's international too, so she works both domestically here and she shows in Europe and she you just, I mean, it's very broad, her impact. Mm -hmm. And so how have you from, you know, the five or six years ago when you started deeply engaging and down this road, what have these various organizations, have you seen more organizations? You talked about an openness in a big hole. Mm -hmm. Take us through like what you believe the ecosystem looks like and how we, we can all sort of plug into this, 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 this world. Wow. Um, I will say that I started looking very, very specifically at my bed neighborhood, which is kind of interesting that I've wound up here, right? Because I thought I was just going to be talking to folks in my neighborhood and we were going to have these like, sit down together, right, and do things. And as I was talking, it was interesting that people started coming to me and pulling me outward. And then I'd go to a conference. I was like, oh, if I'm talking to my neighbors about what they want to be thinking about in the algorithmic world that's coming down the pipe, these people who are making this technology right now, I also need to be talking to them. And if I'm not talking to them, I can't really negotiate this space. Right, so that's the first cross. But then as I started doing this. Um, was it just like an open call or was it like specific people in the neighborhood? No, it was like. Friends, was it very informal or more formal? Just, I'm just curious. It was open call, kind of putting out feelers into the neighborhood to do like a small thing, like in bed -Stuy, which then grew to recess assembly gallery, which was more Brooklyn neighborhood, which then grew to um, the conference, which is global neighborhood in a way. So from tiny, tiny, tiny me calling, trying to get people to show up to like different little pots that opened new doors for me. And I will say that I have joined, like I call it joining families. I've joined a lot of families in the past four or five years, like a lot of families, right? And those go from art tech design to art to the academy and policy work, right? Um, and it's been interesting because I feel like new ink, so new ink, data and society, I beam, creative capital, recess assembly, Sundance, right? Which is a whole other because that's like, oh, this is where I could, should be thinking about that story hard and what the narrativity of it is. And I love that strain of now what I've had to think about in terms of narrativity and how that works, um, which has also led to performativity and how that works. But I feel like I'm this kind of, I don't know, the center of a Venn diagram. But it allows tentacles out in the world and it allows a lot of reach. And I hope that what's happening, excuse me, <coughs> I hope that what's happening is that, that I'm seeding right, like seeding into the world people who are at least thinking about this or taking these ideas, running with them, talking to others about them who might work on it, and that's the best that I think I, I can do. Like often I will say, well, if you're asking me here and why is everybody always asking me? Because there should be so many other folks that could be in the space. Yeah, and, but you know what? At least they're asking you. Well, at least. I'm just it, saying, it, you, know, you got to start somewhere. And so you got to start, start somewhere. Start, but it's yeah. gotten better, right? Sometimes they're not. No, sometimes they're not. This is true. And I've been in the room where it's like, oh, you're the black person and the artist. 
<laughs> right? Seriously. Um, I've been there. <laughs> right? Like, you're the this and the that. And it's like, well, I can tell you of three, four, or five other people who could be in this space, too. Why don't we invite them in? And how do we start to do that? And I feel like that's a really good space for me to be in. Like, there's a way in which I'd like to make myself obsolete in this way, right? I, so I get to go back and just make art that's kind of crazy, that points to things and do that. Yeah, but it doesn't make you obsolete, right? It's just like we want to have all these different layers of yeah. engagement, right? And yeah. so, I mean, because e everyone has something. Everyone, everyone. is such white space. Every, everybody has something to contribute. Everyone. This is true. I think that's my tiredness talking yeah. about obsolete, right? Yeah. Um, I know, I know, but give me five on that. I hear you, girl. Right? You. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of energy. I am, I'm tired. Um, yeah. yeah, Ari. Ari's like, let's yeah, get. Yeah, I know. She's yeah. like, stop talking, y'all. Stop talking. Go. I know. Go. I need a little like, you know, reeling in. Um, that's what happens when you're half Nigerian and half Irish. It's <laughs> like, like mm -hmm. just, just keep talking. <laughs> anyway, okay. Sorry, I digress. Um, Got, questions. Go ahead. Open it up. <laughs> Hi. Um, you spoke a bit about. Can I your name? I like to know. Yeah. yeah sorry. Uh, my name is Jared. Okay. Yeah. Um, Hi, Jared. You spoke a little a bit about surveillance and data collection. Mm -hmm. um, and you touched a bit about the concerns on that. But I was curious, when it came to like building an AI and like collecting family history and family information that is like often intensely personal mm -hmm. um, and is not always broadcast, like you don't always say like, you don't always say to a stranger, like my grandma said X, Y, Z, this is our history. Right. Was there any concern about making like deeply personal, familial history legible to like systems that like you didn't necessarily build from scratch? Yeah, so at the beginning, no. Like, so at the beginning, like who, who thought this was gonna happen to this work, first of all, right? Um, and then I will say that, no, the answer is no. Like, I was doing something with my family. They love me. They give me their info. That's what it was. I love them. I know that I'm going to protect them as much as I can. Um, last year, I was followed by someone who, who did a podcast, The Nod, a podcast. And it was a year. And it was really interesting, because that was what triggered me to go, holy cow, what have I done? And what have I offered of my family? because I'm not sure that I'm prepared to put all of our stuff into the world like that. Um, and what does it mean to put all of our stuff into the world like that? And what does it mean to put um, our data or pieces of us into systems? So for example, the system that I'm doing or working on for the custom voice is a Bell Labs interior system. Um, and I've been on a little hiatus because I don't know if I want to complete it. Right? So right now, they don't have enough to build the whole thing. right? Um, I know that I can get the work done by doing it with them. They, they will share my, and this is what's interesting. Listen to what I'm about to say. They will share my voice back with me. Um, right? But then I put it into and given it to a corporate entity in, in a way. And that doesn't sit well, right? Um, and one of the things with Not the Only One is, one of the reasons it's quirky and wacky and weird is that I'm trying to keep it off of the cloud. It lives on one computer right now, or it can be on different computer systems. But right, I could easily, like there are ways that I could make it work better by using the cloud. Um, I'm trying to keep it so that the data is something that we have agency over. Um, it is our sovereign data, and then I can decide, like, if I want to lease it to someone, maybe that's my prerogative, but it's an outward thought versus, oh, it's just out there. But it's really hindered the project in a lot of ways and makes it something that counters the expectations of people because we all know, like, if you say some of the Google Home, it will say certain things back, and it can do it, albeit in a focused manner, because not the only one is deep learning. I'm trying to leave it deep learning so that it can eventually say what it needs to say. Um, and that is just weird. But also, it has all our content in there, so our content can come out at any time. And you're like, well, what does it mean to give that? And I'm, I'm having, I'm, you know, I'm ruminating and having problems with it and trying to figure out what that means to us. Not so much for my stuff, but for my niece and my aunt. I think that's a very different story. Um, 
don't have an answer yet. Hello, um, my name is Kosi. Um, I am a poet and speculative fiction writer and really intimidated by all the technologists in this space. So thank you for affirming and broadening that I'm tent. I'm glad you're here, man. Um, and so the only way I can like sort of enter into this or I, how I feel it to enter into this is uh, what I hear a lot from this talk is love, right? Um, and sort of love, um, for Bina, right, that being the entry point, like this relationship that you developed, mm -hmm. um, how do you sort of posit we can sort of create stories or create technology uh, sort of rooted in love? Or how, did, how has your work in AI taught you about love? Or do you think AI has the potential to love, right? And is that even a worthwhile project? Um, is that myopic, right? Um, to think, oh, should AI love, or does it have a capacity beyond that, right? Um, before I ramble, like what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm like, like yeah, exactly, idea. like there's a lot there. Yeah, I know, I'm like, that's a good, yeah, interesting. It's, uh, so, I'm reading Toni Morrison right now, so that's so, so, okay, so there are two things that come up, because I'm gonna tell you the first thing I ran through an algorithm was um, Bluest Eye. And, ah, I'm reading that right now. Really? to see what would come out of it. And I'm gonna say it's all love, right? Um, can an AI love? That's really interesting. Can I, can I put love towards an AI? I think yes. Like that's kind of clear to me. Like I have a relationship with these things. And I will say that I have to suspend, like I decided long ago, suspend disbelief so that you can do the work. And so that's how I, that allows me to do it. Cause I could be a skeptic about it and just no, 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 no. But there's a way in which I think slowly that comes back. Does it have the capacity to love back? Uh, I think that would be giving it a lot over time, maybe. I don't know, right? I think we have to plan for the eventualities that these things might work. But I also think, like Kamal was talking yesterday about like what care is right now in an AI world and what that might be with elderly and where does that sit. Um, and how do we work with these things and how do we think through the way we're putting them into our lives becomes a really important question. And I will tell you that one of the images in my slideshow is an Alexa, um, the one with a monitor that I gave my aunt because she's home a lot alone. And really I thought she would listen to the radio, blah, blah, blah. Um, and now it sits on the desk and I come in and she says, Alexa, Stephanie is here. And Right, so now she's relating to it like it is a true entity. She's trying to get me to talk to it on the phone the other day. <laughs> um, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, what have I done? <laughs> a. B, is this something that works for her? Is it disconnecting her from a reality? Like, what is that, where's that line? How is it working, right? But it's clearly something that she's now seeing as a part of her life. And I don't know that if that's because it's something I gave her, so she loves it, invests in it, or if it's something she's investing in, which I need to investigate more, because I'm, I'm, yeah. See, I, uh, this, is my, this is my response these days, like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Because um, I don't know what to do with that. But I also think that, you know, if there is something that can give us a modicum of comfort, no matter what that is, like how do we start to think about it? Like if there's a thing that, like we don't want it to be the substitute, like here, Nan, go, we're gonna put you in this chamber, just talk to this thing forever and we're not coming by, maybe we'll check on you monthly. Nah, like we, ne we need to stand up taller than that. However, if she's home for four hours and it makes her happier to talk to it or have something that plays a radio, right? But there's a big landscape that we're gonna have to negotiate in terms of the way we live with these things. Do we have time for one more question? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so um, sorry. And I, I just, one little c comment on, just to follow up what you're saying. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's all about the story we tell ourselves mm -hmm. and then the story that is adopted in some mainstream way. Mm -hmm. So it's, of yes, I wanna investigate AI and love, can it love? It's not a question, can you? 
If you want to, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. That's so true. You might not know a damn thing about one single language of how any of these computer science languages, Python, Symfony, whatever. You can learn them. Maybe you're never actually going to be a coder because all of us don't need to. More of us do, especially women and people of color, just in terms of the POV and the type of things that we're building. But everyone's never going to do it. I, n I have no, there's not one scintilla of a day I spend thinking to myself, oh, I wish I knew how to code. No, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I really don't. I understand how technology is made. I've run companies where we were making technology. I, so literacy is powerful, too. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, just understanding, like, what is a tech? How do you make it? Who makes it? What's Scrum? When they talk about agile environments, like, what is that? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of power right there. That's a lot of power. And you can Google that. <laughs> I mean, it's and there so are true. overview classes and con I mean, just some baseline information will take you a long way. Long. Because there's more questions in a lot of these things in terms of the evolving applications than there are answers. So it's the story we tell. It's the story we tell ourselves. It's the story we tell er, you know, others. And I, I have just decided, I just, I go into these rooms and I'm like, I know what I'm ta talking about, even when I have no idea what I'm talking about. Because neither do they. Well, that's the thing, right? That's the thing. That's the thing. OK, one last question. I said somebody has like, oh, OK, oh. good. Can we get a sister to ask a question? I mean, go ahead, brother. No, no, I want you to no, ask No, 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 ask your question. But then is there someone else? OK, it, it, you know, cool. We'll have one more after this. Sorry. Uh, Stephanie, I was just wondering how, um, how working on. Sorry, my name is Madebo. Uh, hi, Madebo. Madebo, sorry, I'm Yoruba. Um, uh, so I, I'm wondering whether or how, uh, not the only one working on it, has changed sort of your, uh, your sense or like your relationship with the rest of your archive. I know you said you've been sort of just archiving, like collecting, you know, experiences all along. So how does it feel different now? Huh. Um, I think it feels different in the availability. Like, if it goes, if the archive goes through, not the only one, suddenly it has an availability that the rest of it doesn't. And it also has made me want to take those, like, I don't know, beta tapes that I have and go <laughs> dig them out and and make those available to beta the tapes. thing. Yeah, like, oh say, seriously. I hear you, um, though. I hear right? Yeah, um, the floppy disk, like, <laughs> all of that crap. And, and yeah, like have it come so that it's somewhat available because you know how it is. Um, you have all this stuff. And I, I distinctly remember I graduated from grad school in 97, right? And as a photographer, I left and I had nothing tangible. It was all on a disc. And that felt weird to me. And that all just sat somewhere, right? And it still sits somewhere. I haven't seen it for a long time because, you know, the technology changes and then how to use it. And, um, but now I would like to resurrect that and think about a deeper archive. Because there are many, 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 many hours of tape that I would like to, A, put into um, Not the Only One, and B, have, a, have available. Um, like I have a favorite video of mine is one that my grandmother used to love to wash our faces. We did not like it that much, but we let her do it anyway. <laughs> Um, cause it just made her so happy, right? It, and so I have this video of this um, that I've used in art projects, but I love it. Like I love that being able to l look at that, and not only for me, but to share that for those of those of us or those in our family trajectory who will never have that experience, because um, I think there's so much value in that, right? And so it makes me think. Still, how do I bring this forward so that it is available to them? So maybe I'm just thinking I want it all in there. Um, at least for, so sorry about my voice, um, at least for our use so that we have access to these things. Um, and that's really so that we know who we are, at least from one point forward. Yeah. Akila. Hi, Dora. Stephanie, thank you for being vulnerable uh, and allowing this self-actualization process to happen. But I will say that you 
affirming yourself in such a way and declaring yourself a technologist makes it more real for the people who are going through something similar. So when I'm in a career day in a room full of like black and brown girls, mm -hmm. I'm confident in knowing that there's another there's another technologist out there right. declaring themselves as such, whether or not. I mean, technologists go over their head and invent and create, like the curiosity is the root of it, right? Mm -hmm. So you're a technologist before you even touch technology mm -hmm. because you have the curiosity uh, plus the courage to try. So that was my statement. But my it. question is how resigned or empowered do you feel about mobilizing as a group, like the group uh, people who are parts of marginalized groups to affect policy and regulation around uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence because you you touched on you know the productization of uh ai and ml to marginalize already marginalized groups like how far how far backwards are we going to go um and it's quickly it's it's accelerated exponentially with uh machine learning uh and ai how encouraged do you feel about our ability to affect policy and regulation around it? Mm, is right. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know, right? So here I'm gonna, I'm gonna be vulnerable again and I think about these things all the time and I don't know that I ever come to a conclusion. I'm really hopeful in that I see more and more people in the space um, who are trying to do these things and I think that's hopeful. Um, like I said, this idea of seeding, I'm hoping to like get others out there. Clearly, I don't think I'm the policy person, right? But I will step into spaces where, um, where a, adding a voice se will seem to make a difference, right? Um, but I'm not sure. I'm also gonna say that it's interesting about technologist versus leader, because I will say that I'm a leader, right, yeah. Mutale? Like, I will claim leadership, right? whatever that means. So that must mean that I'm interested in helping people figure out ways to impact policy. I think it's a very important that we do start impacting policy because mm, AI policy, right, ML policy, um, it has a lot to say what we become over the next, what, five, 10, 100, 200 years. Please. I know, right? Yeah. I want to kind of chime in, too. Yeah. I mean, I know. I sort of, I've, said, I've said genius. I've said pioneer. I said, I don't know what else I can. You know, thank you. I'm getting amens over here. Go ahead, I, I, Go ahead. Uh, no, but, you know, I, I was, I think I, I don't know if I said it yes or not, but yeah, I think I did. Stanford came to do some serious study. I was like, we put out a you know, generation of myopic tech leaders because they didn't have, um, the pedagogy got so siloed into STEAM that we weren't, you know, and so now the whole campus is trying to put arts and humanities into the pedagogy of every student that walks on campus, which I thought that was already happening. And I was like shocked. I saw my, my son's a math and science guy. He's going to college next year. I got his like simulated freshman for math. And not an English class on there. There wasn't even an English class. I was shocked to hell. But anyway, long story short is, um, so we started this initiative called the Future Culture Initiative to intervene within Silicon Valley. And I was really tentative about this approach because I'm like, can we intervene in Silicon Valley? Is it too thick and crazy? Do we just need to go, you know, build our own thing on this? You know, like all these questions about power and how to navigate power and where power lives and do we infiltrate or do we throw rocks outside the building? All these questions, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, so we did two experiments simultaneously. One is in Baltimore where it is, I mean, we still are dealing with different kinds of power structures there, but you know, one was like, this is community ground up. And then the other one was putting Stephanie Dinkins in to infiltrate Silicon Valley. <laughs> and, and she said, you're going to be the first one, remember? Yes. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Truly. But, and that's, the, we're putting you in the center of a conversation where people have that power around how these AI systems are going to evolve globally. Mm -hmm. And we're putting you there specifically because you're going to be able to raise the flag on things that nobody else would walk in, the, would be able to have not only the uh, intell intelligence and creativity, but also the the, the substantial body of work 
to stand on and to hold your own in that space. So that's one way of trying to intervene in those ways is, is, is intervening those centers of power. And also, because she didn't say it right, um, when, she, when she spoke, so I actually work in policy and we were, Stephanie and I were in community together this past year on a fellowship. And one of the things that she's done through the AI assembly is bring people together. I'm, I was lucky enough to be one of those people. And when she spoke about leadership, it wasn't just declaring herself as a leader, but it was giving everybody at that table and all of the tables around the power and the permission and the agency to do the same. So she did that for me. I was at that table where she made the declaration last fall and was able, have been able to introduce three different bills to Congress. They're looking at regulation and centering racial and social justice with black women. They have been my experts. So um, Ruha is one um, who we, we both share um, a friendship with, Sophia Noble, who's looked at algorithms of oppression and others. I could go on. I'm not gonna go on too much because I'm doing something tomorrow. But the point was, no, you all better come too, because I'll be, <laughs> no, but. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the point but the point was Stephanie's declaration of leadership became a mantle that I was able to pick up and then I was able to platform the the brilliance of black women in the academy who are very very often marginalized because we are speaking about technology at the intersections of race poverty power and infiltr infiltrating white supremacist systems and getting in the way of people's money that's yeah no and right? and uh, like I said, come back tomorrow. I have, I have, I have all kinds of facts and figures. But yeah, you're speaking about 3.5. Love your way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've been told we have got to. Okay, we got it. We're gonna get We're gonna, gonna, gonna go on, and we're gonna we're gonna we can continue. Obviously, we can spend a lot of time. I would like to say suspend disbelief, and ask for what we need. I want to say we hear you, mm -hmm. we see you. Thank you. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.